I'm delighted that you're here. We have a number of visitors with us. We're glad that you've come and hope you can come back and be with us at other opportunities as we seek to worship God and please Him and go to heaven in the after a while. I want to begin by asking you a question to analyze yourself, and that is, how would you rate or measure yourself spiritually? If you were asked to fill out a form and where do you measure up spiritually in your life? Would you say, I think I am spiritually strong? Maybe even very strong is what I think I am. Is that what you'd put? Or would you say, I think I'm weak spiritually? Maybe even very weak. I feel like I'm very weak, you may say. Or would you say, I'm stronger than I was, and I'm getting stronger? Looking back, I, I was much weaker in time past, and, and I've been working, and I'm growing, and I'm developing, and, and I'm stronger than I was, and I'm getting even stronger. Or would you say, I'm weaker than I was, and I feel like I'm getting even weaker spiritually? How would you classify yourself? 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 talks about four categories of people that need some attention. And he said, I exhort you, brethren, warn those, number one, who are unruly. Number two, comfort the faint-hearted. And number three, uphold the weak. And number four, be patient to all. Notice our text addresses those that are weak. You say, I look at myself and I feel like I may be weaker and getting weaker maybe. What is spiritual weakness about? Well, I want you to see, that's not the same thing as being unfaithful, the unruly. The one who is rebelling against God and pushing away from God and deciding I'm not going to live in harmony with His will anymore. That's not the same thing in this context. Now, weakness may lead to unfaithfulness, but that's not the same thing. So when you say, I feel like I'm getting weaker, doesn't mean I'm unfaithful yet. Secondly, it's not the same as being discouraged, the faint-hearted in our text. You say, well, I'm weak because I'm discouraged. That's not the same thing. Discouragement may lead to weakness, which may lead to unfaithfulness. That's true. But discouragement is not weakness within itself, not in this context at least. And it's not the same as one who could be stronger in the future. If you're looking at yourself and you say, well, you know what, I never thought of myself as weak, but I look to the future and I believe I could have more knowledge and I believe I could be stronger and better in certain areas in my life. That doesn't mean you're weak. Because every one of us ought to be growing and maturing and hopefully a year from now be stronger than we are now. When we talk about spiritual weakness, we need to examine ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 said, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. So we need to be asking this question, could I be getting weaker spiritually? And if so, why is that the case? So as we asked that question a moment ago, your answer may have been, I'm strong or I'm weak. But if you're saying, you know what, I'm weaker than I was, I recognize that. And I feel like I'm getting weaker. My next question is, why is that the case? Why am I getting weaker? So this morning, let's raise the question, am I getting weaker spiritually we're talking about? And if so, why is that the case? Am I getting weaker? And so every one of us need to examine ourselves and ask the question, could I be getting weaker spiritually? And if so, why is that the case? So let's look at these points. Let's start with this. Let's talk about the goal we should have to be strong and growing. Our goal should be that as a Christian, I want to be a strong Christian. I want to have strong faith and I want to be increasing and growing in my faith. Let's develop that concept. We should be growing stronger. This is the kind of faith we should desire. What kind of faith? Well, strong faith. Let's go to Romans chapter 4. Abraham the text says, concerning the promise that God gave him in Romans chapter 4, beginning at verse 19, 
that Abraham was not weak in faith. That means he was strong. And he did not consider his own body already dead, though he was about 100 years old, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb, but he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. Oh, what strong faith Abraham had. So our goal should be, this is the kind of faith I want. I want strong faith like Abraham. I want great faith. Remember the centurion to whom Jesus said, I have not seen so great faith, not even in Israel. You've got great faith. So what kind of faith do you want? He said, I want to have great faith. I want to have strong. I want the kind of faith that doesn't fail. You remember Jesus told Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. That means it's possible to have the kind of faith that doesn't fail. But his failed. It means that the bottom fell out of his faith. You see, your faith is going to be tried. It's going to be tested, put to the strain and put to the test. It doesn't have to fail. It did for Peter, but it doesn't for you. It doesn't have to fail. The bottom doesn't have to fall out of your faith. You see, I want the kind of faith that doesn't fail when under pressure. Well, that means then that if that's the kind of faith that I have, I need to be maturing and I need to be growing stronger every day. In fact, we read in 2 Thessalonians 1 and in verse 3. You see, when Paul had left Thessalonica under a cloud of persecution, he sent a letter back concerning the things that he needed to talk to them about and he was concerned about their welfare. And then he heard, he heard the report and he rejoiced that their faith groweth exceedingly. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so rejoicing over the fact that I hear the report, your faith is growing, but not only growing, it's exceedingly growing. We need to be growing. Our faith should grow. Our faith should increase. You remember the disciples were told to forgive even to seven times in the same day, and they didn't think they could do that, so they said, Lord, increase our faith. We don't know if we can do that with the faith we have. So increase our faith, he said. So our faith needs to be the kind that's increasing and growing and getting stronger. 2 Peter 3.18 says we're to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. I know what growing in knowledge means. What does it mean to grow in grace, in favor with God? Grow more pleasing and acceptable unto God. Pleasing more today than I did yesterday. We ought to be growing and maturing. We ought to have the developing faith that is capable of doing more than we did in the past. You say, well, what's that about? Well, Hebrews 5 says, when the time you ought to be teachers, you have needed someone to teach you again. See, they should have developed to the point when they weren't teachers before, they should be teachers now, able to do something they couldn't do before, able to handle something they couldn't handle before, more mature now than they were before. So we need to be growing and developing in our faith and become more capable of doing more and more. Paul would write, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 10, that we should increase more and more. Not increasing just a little bit, but more and more growing and increasing. You see the goal we should have? See, we should have the kind of goal that says we're growing in our faith. It's increasing. We're growing in knowledge and in grace. Developing our faith, increasing more and more. You say, but how do I do that? How do I grow stronger? How can I make sure that my faith is increasing so that I have that strong faith that doesn't fail and the bottom doesn't fall out of my faith? I need to be feasting on the Word. I need to be feasting on the Word. You see, the Word is the source of our strength and our encouragement. Let's go to Acts 20 and verse verse 32. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. This is Paul speaking to the elders of the church at Ephesus, and he says, I commend you to the word of His grace. That's the word of God. That's the revelation of God, which is able to build you up. You want to be stronger? You want to be built up? The word of God does that. You say, I I feel like I'm getting weaker. How much time are you spending with the word? Are you studying the word? Are you digging into the word? Paul said, I commend you to the word, which is able to build you up. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want to develop a flow of thought in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 with you, if you will. 1 Corinthians 14, beginning at verse 1. This is in the context of spiritual gifts where some were desiring tongues as the superior gift. They thought that's an exciting gift. Oh, listen to the speaking in tongues. But there may not be an interpreter, so no one benefits from that. And so Paul's point is prophecy would be better 
than tongues if there's no interpretation. Why is that? Because of the edification receiving from the word. So let's follow the thought. Notice in verse 2, he said, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. In other words, he doesn't get any revelation if there's not an interpretation. However, he speaks mysteries. Now verse 3, But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Why is prophecy so great? Because it involves the revelation of God. It involves the revelation of the Word, and that edifies. Let's go further. Look at verse 4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. How so? Because he's revealing the revelation of God, and that's the source of edification. Now verse 5. I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesied. Now Paul, why you say that? For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues. Wait a minute, Paul. Wait a minute. The tongues are so exciting, though. I know that, I know that. But unless he interprets that the church may receive edification. You see, when there's prophecy, the revelation of God's Word, there's edification. When tongues are spoken and they are interpreted, there is edification. Where does edification come from? From the Word of God itself. So you say, I want to be strong, I want to be edified. Feast on the Word. We should have this craving and thirsting for the Word. As babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that they may grow thereby. Remember that? 1 Peter chapter 2. See, just as a babe is craving for milk so that they can grow, so likewise we need to crave for the Word of God that we may grow by that. Now, Psalm 119, there is not a section of Scripture that praises the Word of God more than Psalm 119. And we could almost go to any verse in Psalms 119 and find the principle that we're talking about of this love and this craving and thirsting. Like verse 16, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Look at verse 72, just as one more sampling of that. Verse 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Think of a pile of gold and silver, and you say, well, I crave after that. I would love to have that. So much more so the Word of God should be craved and thirsting and hungering after that. Our study needs to be consistent. What do we mean by that? Well, it doesn't need to be the kind of study that we study a little bit, and then we give up on that for a while, and then we may come back a little bit later. The Bereans searched the Scriptures daily whether the things were so. Remember that, Acts 17, 11? And in your law I meditate day and night, the psalmist would say in Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. Till I come, Paul said, give attendance unto reading. Here is some time spent with the Scripture consistently. And when we do that, we will increase in our knowledge. We will increase in our wisdom, and we will increase in our purity. You want to grow? See, I'd like to be wiser, spend time with the Word. I'd like to have more knowledge, spend time with the Word. I would like to live purer. Spend time with the Word. I've never met a person yet who would describe themselves to me, I've gotten weaker over the last year or two or three or four. Who at the same time told me, but I've kept up my diligent study all during that time. I have never, ever run into anybody who told me that. You stop and think about that. There's some connection with not feeding on the Word and feasting on the Word and the getting weaker as time goes on. What else can I do? I can pray fervently. Pray fervently. Have regular times of prayer. Do you remember what the psalmist said? Morning, evening, and noon, I will pray to you. That's that psalm, Psalm 55, where he's crying out and thinking about maybe just running away. But he found out running to God was much better, and he prayed on a regular basis. Daniel had regular times since his early days. Daniel 6 is written when Daniel was an old man, perhaps 90 years of age. And the text says he prayed to God three times that day, as was his custom since the early days, since he was a teen. He'd been doing this for years. Had regular times for prayer. I remind you that Jesus made in schedule time for prayer. If prayer is a difficult thing for you, say, I'd like to pray and I love to pray and I, I want to pray more, but I just have a hard time finding time, then make and schedule time for prayer. 
Because we make and schedule time for things we want to do. You say, what do these passages have to do with that? Well, Jesus went out into a solitary place. A long while before daylight, he went out into a solitary place, and there he prayed. He got up before daylight and went and scheduled and made time for prayer in his schedule. On another occasion in Luke 6, he spent all night in prayer, went to the mountains to pray and spent all night in prayer unto God. He made and he scheduled time for prayer. You'll find yourself growing if you pray fervently. Here's something else prayer does. It's powerful. And you'll begin to see example after example after example where you'll have to stop during your prayers and say, I'm thankful for the many, many times I'm seeing you answer my prayer. The effectual fervent prayer for a righteous man avails much. Now what's interesting about Luke 18 is prayer is connected with faith. We're talking about growing our faith. Jesus spoke a parable, Luke 18, 1. Are you noticing the text? Spoke a parable to this end that men ought always to pray and not faint. Take note of that. Then drop down to verse 8. Look at verse 8. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? There's a connection between that faith of verse 8 and this always praying of verse 1. Well, men still have faith enough that they're continuing to pray. When we continue to pray, that's connected with our faith. Has a great connection with our faith. But here's something else. Worship faithfully. Worship faithfully. You see, worship is not a spectator event that I come to watch and I want to see what's going on. And if I miss, no big deal. Because I'm not involved. It's like going to a ball game. I'm not the participant, I'm not playing on the field. So if I'm in the stands and I leave, that's no big deal. The game goes on. Worship is not a spectator event. It's a place where we go and we participate. Look at Ephesians 5. Speaking to yourselves in song. We're not listening to the song merely, but we're speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 14 and in verse 16, in again, the context of the spiritual gifts and, and no one is to be leading in tongues unless there's an interpreter, because how can he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks? What does that mean? He's participating too. That's his prayer too. He's following in that prayer. He's participating. And by so doing, we're edified and we're made stronger. Let's go back to that passage in 1 Corinthians 14 since that's on our mind. Remember that he's to give prophecy and not the speaking in tongues merely. There's to be prophecy in the day of spiritual gifts. Why? So that the church may be edified. They came together to be edified, to be built up. That's what takes place when we assemble for worship. What else can I do that I might grow stronger? I can feast on the Word, pray fervently, worship faithfully. I can use the faith that I have and make it active. How so? The Bible talks about exercise. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 7. But profane, reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. You say, I'm not sure he's trying to make a parallel with, with body. Oh, yeah, he is, because look at the next verse. For bodily exercise profits little. But godliness, which he just said exercise, is profitable unto all things. His point is, your godliness is the exercising of your faith. That which you exercise, you increase. And you grow in that. See, the same thing. Having their senses exercised, Hebrews chapter 5. We need to practice what we know. And isn't it interesting in Luke 17? Remember the statement where the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. We need stronger faith if you expect us to do that. Remember that? The very next statement, the very next statement was, if you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, what on earth is he talking about? That if you have the smallest degree of faith, use the faith that you have and it grows and increases. You say, my faith is weak. I, I don't think I can do some of the difficult things. But you can do more than what you're doing if your faith is that weak. And use the faith that you have and it gets stronger through that exercise. Now then, I know what the goal should be. 
I need to be strong and I need to be growing, but I want us to consider secondly that it's altogether possible that even if I have been strong, I can get weaker. That's altogether possible. You see, you can go backwards spiritually. Paul wrote to the Galatians and said, you did run well who did hinder you. That means it's possible I'm not running as well as I was. It's like running a race. And I was running and I'm out there and I'm just making it and I'm doing good with my time and it looks like I'm going to make the finish and then I'm slacking a little bit and I'm not running like I was. I'm getting weaker. You see, it's possible your fire could go out. You left your first love. Paul told the church at Ephesus. I mean, the enthusiasm is gone. The fire has gone out. You had a fire roaring and burning in you when you obeyed the gospel. You were set on fire. You couldn't do enough and get enough and study enough, but your fire's gone out. That's possible. There's something else that's possible. We could become like the church at Laodicea, lukewarm that's neither cold nor hot. Maybe they were hot at one time, but now they're lukewarm. You ever sit down to eat a meal or maybe drink some coffee and, and it's lukewarm and it's not any good, but at one time it was hot, but it ain't anymore. Not quite the same, is it? That could happen to your faith. Here's something else that could happen to your faith. Your faith could fail. Remember Jesus said, I prayed for you that your faith fail not. It means your faith can fail. As we've described, your bottom could fall out of your faith. Abraham, since he was not weak in faith, tells me it's possible I could be weak in faith. My faith could get weak. See, I can go backwards. But that happens slow and gradual. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. We'll say more about this passage in context in a moment. Let us give the morning's heed to the things that we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Slipping, or one translation will say drift. The footnote in the King James would say run out as a leaking vessels. That means it's possible for me to drift and to spiritually leak. Just a drop here and a drop there and a drop here and a drop there and I'm losing my spirituality. That's possible. It describes a slow, gradual process. That makes it hard to recognize. Now if you could picture physically that one day you were able, you're able to lift, say, 100 pounds easily. You could just pick 100 pounds up and it's no problem at all. And then the next morning you get up and you can't even pick up five pounds. You would say, something's wrong. I don't know why. Yesterday I could lift up the 100-pound bag, but now I can't even pick up a 5-pound bag of sugar. I can't do that. Something's wrong. But if over time you can't lift that 100 pounds, but you could 99 and a half, and then 99, and then 85, and, and then now you just keep gradually getting down. And so over a period of a year, now you can't lift 5 pounds. You didn't notice it so well, did you? Same thing happens spiritually. Hardly anyone ever just quits serving the Lord. It happens over time. Are you getting spiritually weaker? See, that doesn't happen overnight. That happens over time. Gradually you get weaker. That makes it hard to take notice of. Now, what are some signs that tell you it's happening to you? You say, well, what do I need to look for to know that maybe I am getting weaker and my faith is going backwards? How do I know? One is a loss of zeal and a loss of enthusiasm. Let's start with the Revelation passage and then we'll go to Isaiah. Revelation chapter 2, here was the church at Ephesus that had left their first love. That means they had had it. There was something about the fire, the enthusiasm they once had when they obeyed the gospel. Remember the books that they brought and they burned because of their desire to serve the Lord and give up their, their, uh, their false ways. Then they came and burned the 50,000. It was worth 50,000 pieces of silver and they burned this great gigantic fire because they're giving up. They're excited about serving the Lord. They've lost. The honeymoon is over. The fire is gone. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29. And look at verse 13. Jesus quotes this in the New Testament. Inasmuch as the people draw nigh to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They're saying the right thing, but their heart's not there. 
They're pledging allegiance, but the enthusiasm is not there. Notice the next phrase, though. Still there at verse 13? And their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. The New American Standard, I believe it is, says they learned by rote. In other words, their service had deteriorated into a weary routine. Does that happen to your service? Could that happen to me? No longer excited and enthused? Here's another evidence or sign that it could be happening. The loss of spiritual interest. Remember that we've already cited 1 Peter chapter 2. The craving and thirsting as babes desire the sincere milk of the word. You say, I don't crave it like I used to. I used to just, I couldn't study enough. I couldn't read enough. I couldn't learn enough. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't spend enough time with the scriptures and that doesn't excite me anymore. I've just kind of lost some spiritual interest. I have less interest now in studying and learning the Bible than I did in the past. I'm not as bothered by sin in myself or in others. Maybe by missing a lot of services. By missing a lot of services, that creates problems. More about that in a moment. Finally, I know the goal, and I know it's possible to get weaker, but here's our question. Why do Christians get weaker? Why is that? If you answered the question earlier, I feel like I'm getting weaker. The next question is why? Why'd that happen to you? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard. Let's stop there for a moment. What's he talking about? The revelation of God. Give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard from the Word of God. Go back to that. Pay close attention to that. Give earnest heed to the things that we have heard. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute now. Why? Why? Lest at any time we should drift away or lest we drift away. You see, if we don't give them earnest heed, the possibility is we could drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Do you see the connection between this neglect and drifting away? When they're no longer giving the morning's tea, we drift away because we neglect something. Let's talk about that word neglect. What does that mean? What does it mean to neglect? Bedag says, to have no care for, to neglect, to be unconcerned. And so here's the question. Could it be that I'm neglecting my salvation? I'm neglecting my spirituality. You say, I don't know. What does that mean? All right. It means to not have care for, to neglect, to be unconcerned. Thayer says it means to be careless of and to neglect that I'm not giving the proper care. Well, Nida says it means to not think about and thus not respond appropriately to. If I'm not thinking about something, I'm not giving attention to it, I'm not responding appropriately to that. That's neglect. To disregard, to pay no attention to. Here's how the word is translated. It's translated neglect twice. To neglect not the gift, and then in our text. To disregard and negligent. But let's go to Matthew 22. Now, this one's quite interesting. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Same word. Matthew 22 and in verse 5. This is in the parable of the wedding feast where the master sent out those and called them invited to come. And he said, I've spread the dinner at verse 4 and my oxen and, and cattle have been killed and all things are ready to come to the wedding feast. But they made light of it. And treated him spitefully and killed him. They made light of it. That word, or words, make light, come from the same word translated neglect. They disregarded the invitation. They were unconcerned about the invitation. They didn't pay any attention to it. You see, anything I'm neglecting, I'm really making light of that. That's what the word neglect means. Now, things that are neglected deteriorate. You neglect your health, it's going to deteriorate. 
You start feeling pains. You start seeing signs. Something's not going right. Something you can't do that you did a few days ago. Some warning signs begin to flare up and maybe even the doctor is warning you, but you just stick unconcerned about it. You pay no attention to that and your health will deteriorate. So don't be surprised when your health just goes, goes to the bottom. Same thing with your house. You say, well, I noticed there's a leak and I noticed the plumbing had backed up and I noticed some spots on the ceiling and so you just ignore all of that. Your house is going to deteriorate. Same thing with your car, same thing with your money and especially is that true spiritually. Things that are neglected deteriorate. So why do Christians get weaker? Let's begin to list some reasons. Number one, they fail to feed their faith. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. They fail to feed their faith. This was Paul's prayer for the Colossians. And he said, for this reason since the day you, we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, we're not through, but let's get to the point. He said, I've been praying for you at Colossae. I, I've, been, I've been praying. And what I want for you and what I hope for you is you be filled with the knowledge of God's will. I want you to be full of it. Okay, Paul, what, what's that about? Look at verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and longsuffering with joy. I want you to be strong. I want you to please God. I want you to walk worthy. And I want you to be filled with the knowledge of His will. And that's how that's going to be accomplished. I want you to feed your faith. Why do some Christians get weaker? Because they fail to feed their faith. Now, there may be an exception to that, but I've never come across one where one is getting weaker and at the same time they say, you know what, I've kept up my Bible study and in fact I've increased my Bible study and I'm studying more than I ever have before, but I'm getting weaker all the time. I've never run into that person. Never. You may have, but I have never seen that. Here's a second reason. They fail to add to their faith. This is the passage that deals with the Christian graces. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance. You start with your faith and you start adding to that. Every one of those things are relative in their nature, meaning there's, there's still room for growth. Knowledge, love, patience. Just keep growing in that. Now notice that verse 5, if you're still there at the text, giving all diligence putting every effort forth. You say, why are some Christians getting weaker? They fail to feed their faith, and they fail to be diligent. Or they may have the desire, I want more knowledge, I want to be more patient, I want to have greater love, I want to increase in this area, and I want to, but they're not being diligent. I really want to put forth greater effort. Here's another reason. They fail to exercise their faith. They fail to use the faith they have. And you say, I think I recognize that, Luke 17. Yeah, that's where we've been. Luke 5, Luke 17, 5, increase our faith. Verse 6, if you have the faith as a grain of a mustard seed, use the faith that you have. You say, I don't think my faith is strong enough to do, and then you fill in the blank. But you do have some faith, or you wouldn't even be here. Use the faith that you have. Exercise it. You say, I can't lift but five pounds. Well, then lift five pounds. Don't worry about the hundred. Start with the five until you get to six, and then to seven, and then to eight, and then to ten, and then let's work up till we get to the hundred. But right now, if all the strength you have is to lift five pounds, then start with four. Let's start lifting that, and let's see what we can do. You say, I wish I had the faith of, well, I wish we all had the faith of brother so-and-so. But whatever faith you have, use your faith. Here's something else. They fail to check their faith. Why are some people physically getting weaker? Because they're not doing self-examination or letting the doctor examine them. They're not checking themselves out to see what's wrong. Do I have a heart problem? Do I have a lung problem? What's, what, what's going on? And we fail to check ourselves to see if we're in the faith. Is my faith where it needs to be? Am I doing what I should be? And listen to this one carefully. Sometimes we miss services that strengthen 
our faith. We miss services that strengthen our faith. When we miss, here's what we miss when we're absent, justified or not. You say, I've got good, I've got good reason why I'm not. Okay, great. That's great. But here's what we miss. We miss out on edification. Because that's what goes on in the assembly. The church edifies itself in love, Ephesians 4, 16. And I've already cited Ephesians 5. We're speaking to one another. We're singing praises to God, but we're speaking to one another, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. So we're edifying one another. And so when I'm not here, what I miss is I miss out on some strengthening of the edification. I miss out on this, giving encouragement. You see, not only am I to receive encouragement by being here, but my being here should give some encouragement. How so? Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Ephesians 5. Hebrews 10, verse 24, and you said, oh yeah, that's forsaking the No, that's the next verse. That's the next verse. This one says that we ought to exhort one another more daily as we see the day approaching. Exhort and encourage one another daily. And then the next verse mentions not forsaking the assembly. There's something else we miss out on. Praising God. Acts 2, when the church was established in Acts 2, that was on the first day of the week. They came together and they worshiped and they praised God, verse 42. Verse 47 says they were doing that very thing. Praising God and having favor with all the people. So what have you missed out on? Well, an occasion to praise and give glory to God. It's God-designed worship. And we miss out on gaining some knowledge. You see, Hebrews 5, I know 2 Peter 3, growing in grace and the knowledge is mentioned, but Hebrews 5 says, when the, the, this possible that what I once knew I could forget if I'm not reminded of that. You say, well, that Bible class, that was reminding me of things I already knew. And so the sermon was reminding me. Yeah, that's because you're reminded of time and again. You don't get reminded of that, you're going to forget it. Evidence? Hebrews 5. So what do I miss when I'm absent? I miss a lot of things, like, like Thomas, who wasn't there. Remember that? So that means I'm made weaker and weaker the more I miss. Now listen to this carefully. If attendance, not by itself, but by, by being in worship, makes me stronger, then missing has got to make me weaker. If not, why not? Now, you might have missed that, so let's go over that one again, slowly and carefully. If being present in the worship service makes me stronger, then missing has got to make me weaker. That means the more I miss, the weaker I get. That is true whether the absence is justified or not. Someone said, but, but see, I've got good reason. My, my work schedule, fine. I'll leave that with you. My sickness, fine, I'll leave that with you. I'm simply saying the more I miss, the weaker I get justified or not. Let me illustrate. The person who doesn't eat physical food or very much of it. The end result is they get physically weak. Now, that's true whether that is by choice or not. It may be, someone said, oh, well, in my case, I, I don't just choose not to eat. I know some people that choose not to eat, but in my case, I can't eat. I've got this condition where I can't eat. Okay. It's still true. Or someone else may feel like they're in bondage and my food is being restricted and I don't have very much food given to me, and so I'm getting weaker because I'm not allowed food. Okay. Still true. You don't eat, you get physically weaker. For whatever reason it may be, the same thing is true when it comes to worship. When I don't attend worship where I'm edified and built up, whatever the reason may be, I still end up spiritually weak. Someone said, Well, I'm not one of those that just choose not to come. I got that. Those are getting weaker. But when I miss perpetually because of whatever reason, it may be my work. It may be through sickness, maybe taking care of someone who's sick. 
be careful because it could make you weaker. I've known of people who've cared for those who are sick and could not help the fact that they had to miss to take care of someone who was indeed sick. And I've warned them, I tell you what's going to happen over a period of time, this goes on for three months, six months, a year, year and a half, two years, you will end up being spiritually weaker than you were before. But I, can't, I know you can't help it. My point is you'll still get spiritually weaker. It's going to happen. I can't help my work schedule. Got it. I got that. And so let's just say for argument's sake, that's all justified. I've got that. You still will end up being spiritually weaker. So why does the Christian get weaker? That was our question. We're failing to feed our faith. We're failing to be diligent and exercise our faith. We may fail to check our faith, or we may be missing a lot of services that could strengthen and make our faith stronger. Am I getting weaker? I hope not. I hope your answer to the question was, no, I'm not getting weaker. I'm getting stronger. I'm stronger than I was, and I'm getting stronger. Great. I hope you are. But if your answer was, I'm weak and I'm getting weaker, the question is, why is that? Our goal should be to be strong and growing. It's possible I could be getting weaker. We've tried to give answers as to why the Christian sometimes gets weaker and weaker. Justified or not, there may be some things that make us indeed weaker. May that cause us to examine ourselves and say, you know what, I want to be stronger. I want to work on that. Let it serve not as a condemnation, but as a challenge. I want to be stronger. I want to be better. There may be one or more present who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come this morning believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you acknowledge your faith in Christ and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?